well. Um, before we begin, I'll just go over a couple of things for the meeting. Uh, first of all, I'm joining you from North Island College in Campbell River, um, and we're pleased to be hosting the event. We are on the traditional territories of the Wiwekai, Wiwekum, and Kwekan nations, and we would also like to thank NSERC for the funding to be able to host this event. So um, thank you, everyone. Uh, today we have Tom and Melissa joining us. Tom is from West Coast Kelp, and Melissa is from Alaska, and they're both going to be presenting for about 10 to 15 minutes um, of their time to explain a few of the cool things that those guys do. Um, we are going to be recording the meeting today, and uh, we'll hopefully make that meeting available online later on. I will send out a further email to let you guys know where that will be available to, um, so you guys can share that around as well. Because uh, there are a few people that asked about that, and we have a few people that have not been able to make it. And uh, the only other thing that would be really cool is if you guys could drop your the location of where you're joining us from today in the chat. That would be awesome, just so we can note down if we have like a good reach or not, and if we can reach out to some other people to kind of share the meeting around a little bit more for next time. Uh, I think that that is about everything. So I'm going to hand it over to Tom uh, to get the meeting started. He's got a nice presentation ready for us. So Tom will present for about 10 to 15 minutes. Then we'll switch straight into Melissa's presentation. And then we'll have some time at the end, 10 to 15 minutes, maybe a bit more, who knows, for some questions for those guys or even us. And uh, yeah, that that's the general plan. Um, we're going to have a few more of these seminars as well throughout the year, probably up until June when summer kicks off and everyone starts getting really busy. Uh, so please join us for the next couple of presentations as well. Um, next month's one might be a little earlier in the morning. Uh, we have some people joining us from Norway to share some of the cool things they're doing with kelp. So um, yeah, please join us for that. Uh, but without further ado, I'll hand it over to Tom, and he's going to explain some of the cool things that he's doing with kelp. So fire away, Tom. Thank you, Logan. Can you see my slides? I can. Yeah. OK. You're good Great. to go. Great. Well, hi, everyone. My name is Tom Campbell, and I'm the president and founder of West Coast Kelp, a startup based out of Bamfield in the Hahuthli, or traditional territory of the Hawaiian First Nations. I'd like to begin by thanking Logan and his colleagues at NIC's Center for Applied Research, Innovation and Technology and Innovation for inviting me to participate in this kelp seminar. Today, I'm going to be talking about West Coast Kelp and what we do, as well as green gravel, a new and exciting tool for kelp forest restoration. Kelp forest restoration and kelp farming present coastal communities with a unique opportunity to engage with a regenerative and sustainable resource of immense potential. As humanity continues to uh, continues down the path of acceptance and understanding that our environmental interests and our economic interests can no longer be disassociated, it is essential to identify industries that can provide economic prosperity without compromising the ecosystems that we so deeply depend on. West Coast Kelp's mission is to enable large scale, high impact kelp forest restoration and research and support the development of a sustainable kelp farming industry in BC. So how does West Coast Kelp intend to do this? Well, there are three main pillars to West Coast Kelp's operations that have been selected to achieve our mission. West Coast Kelp's primary focus is enabling kelp farmers and restoration groups by providing them with a secure supply of reliable kelp seed. Insufficient seed supply is a major bottleneck that has prevented BC from developing a diverse and strengthened kelp farming industry. Furthermore, insufficient seed supply is also one of the bottlenecks inhibiting large-scale kelp forest restoration and research. 
When West Coast Kelp started in early 2022, our first objective was to construct a functional seed nursery located on the campus of the Bamfield Marine Sciences Center. This nursery was specifically designed to A, produce commercial quantities of green gravel, a type of kelp seed that I'll talk a little bit more about later, and B, conduct R&D intended to streamline and increase the efficiency of seed production systems. Our nursery is capable of producing two kinds of kelp seed, spools of kelp twine, which is traditionally used by kelp farmers, and green gravel aimed to be used in kelp forest restoration. In addition to seed production, West Coast Kelp provides our clients and collaborators with kelp forest monitoring and restoration services. Successful restoration begins with effective monitoring and understanding the drivers of kelp forest decline in the area of interest, which is essential to, su to successfully restoring or reinforce reinforcing kelp forest ecosystems. The third pillar of West Coast Kelp's operations is aquaculture. We intend to leverage our ability to produce commercial quantities of high quality kelp seed to break down one of the barriers to entry for aspiring kelp farmers, access to seed. By securing seed supply, West Coast Kelp is increasing the economic stability of this emerging industry. Currently, our seed nursery has the capacity to supply 20 hectares of kelp farm area per year. By 2024, we will increase our production capacity to 50 hectares through a nursery expansion and the adoption of a more efficient seed production system that we recently developed. West Coast Kelp also provides our clients kelp farming consultation and operational services. We're currently managing a two hectare kelp farm in Barkley Sound for an indigenous owned kelp farming business looking to create habitat and economic opportunities in the community. So that's a little bit about West Coast Kelp and what we do. So now I'm gonna to shift to the topic of green gravel. Uh, green gravel is a new form of kelp seed and an exciting tool in the battle against declining kelp forest ecosystems. Now, green gravel can be seen as a method or a kind of kelp seed that consists of juvenile kelp propagules attached to small rocks reared in a land-based nursery prior to being outplanted in the field. Green gravel as a method to restore kelp forests has received a lot of attention and excitement since 2020 when the method was first published by Stein Fredrickson and his colleagues in Nature Scientific Reports. This method is heralded as being scalable and cost-effective when compared to previous kelp restoration methods, which usually involved hiring divers to install underwater infrastructure, driving up the cost of these projects. Green gravel does not require scuba divers or the installation of underwater infrastructure. Instead, it can be scattered by hand from the deck of a boat. After being deployed, the juvenile kelp continued to develop and their hold fast, So how do we make this stuff? Well, by collecting kelp sori, which is plural for sorus, which is a fancy word for spore patch. And you can see that. I don't know if you can see my mouse, but this is the spore patch here in the first picture in the top left. After we collect these spore patches, we then put them through a process in order to release the spores from the tissues. And then we'll have a solution of spores in seawater at a hyper-concentrated solution. We then need to dilute that solution to a specific density of spores per milliliter. And once we have that desired density, we then soak our rocks in that solution for a period of time to allow these spores to swim through the water and settle onto the rocks. Once the spores have settled, we then move them to our growth chambers where we provide them with adequate light, water, flow, and nutrients so that they can grow um, to become healthy adult kelp plants. Once the spores have settled onto the rocks, they uh, grow into what's called a gametophyte, which is the microscopic life stage of kelps. And the gametophytes are either male or female. The female gametophytes produce an egg, which then releases a pheromone telling the male gametophyte it's time to release its sperm. The sperm then swim through the water and fertilize the egg. And once the eggs are fertilized, they start to develop into baby kelp blades that you can see here in the red circle. Now, if we work out the conditions just right, we can maximize their growth rates so that after six to eight weeks, we then have visible kelp propagules on the cultivated uh, green gravel here. By day 96, you can see we have green gravel ready for field outplanting trials. These, these kelp propagules are about four to seven centimeters in length. In the second picture from the right, I'd just like to point out the trays that West Coast Kelp is using in our nursery for the production of green gravel. At our current maximum capacity, we can produce 60 of these trays per batch, 
And I'd really like to know how much area of kelp forest that amount of green gravel can restore. So what are the next steps? Well, although there's been a small handful of green gravel field experiments, they have been small in scale with varying degrees of success. Green gravel as a method is at a stage now where it needs to be pushed beyond the proof of concept stage. There are so many questions about the efficacy of this method with regards to species, planting density, presence or absence of herbivores, time of year we outplant, substrate, depth, wave exposure, etc. If this restoration method is going to live up to its hype and meet its full potential to, to address declining kelp forests, we need more green gravel projects that will incorporate these kinds of variables into their research. We need more green gravel projects, or we need more projects, restoration projects, that are getting green gravel in the water with well thought out monitoring programs to evaluate how green gravel performs under different kinds of biotic and abiotic environments. Now, let me be clear, West Coast Kelp isn't necessarily looking to lead these kinds of projects. That would be beyond our scope and expertise. Instead, we're looking to supply researchers, conservation groups, and other businesses with high quality, reliable seed so that they can focus on addressing other challenges associated with the in-the-field component of kelp forest restoration. So if you're interested in kelp restoration or kelp farming, please don't hesitate to get in touch. Um, thank you so much. And I'd like to close once again by thanking North Island College's Center for Applied Research, Technology and Innovation for inviting me to talk. I'll pass it back to you, Logan. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. That was fantastic. Nice and great overview of what you're doing over there. So I'm excited to hear about everyone's questions that they have for you. Uh, and it sounds like if anyone has any green gravel project ideas that they want to do with Tom, that they should reach out. Go for it. Um, Melissa, I'll grab you now and uh, you can uh, go for it. Right, let me share my screen. Can you see that? Yep, you look good to go on my end. Okay, great. So my name is Melissa Good. Um, I go by Missy as well. I'm the Mariculture Specialist with Alaska Sea Grant, and I'm going to talk to you guys today about aquatic farming in Alaska and touch on some site assessment tools that we've been working on. Uh, so who are we? Uh, Alaska Sea Grant is a statewide program in Alaska. You could Melissa, you've just uh, been muted, I think. Oh, weird. OK, yep. Now I should be unmuted. I don't know how that happened. But uh, yeah, let me start all over. So Alaska Sea Grant is a statewide program here in Alaska. We are housed within the University of Alaska Fairbanks, um, but we're a partnership between the university and. Oh, no, hold on. I disappeared. Can you still see my screen? Yep, we can still see you. Oh, uh, you're gone. Uh oh. Don't know what's going on. My screen disappeared on me. That's okay. Okay, there we go. Looks like we're back. <laughs> Anyways, uh, just to say this again, we're part of a national network. There are 34 programs across uh, the United States, and we are here to enhance the practical use and conservation of coastal, marine, and Great Lake resources in order to create sustainable economy and environment. So what is mariculture? I'm sure many of you on here know this, but mariculture is growing of marine organisms in a marine environment. And that could be enhancement, restoration, or farming. And something that I want to point out here is that in Alaska, it does not include fin fish. Uh, fish farming in Alaska is illegal. So when we talk about mariculture, we specifically are talking about shellfish and seaweeds. So what is currently being farmed in Alaska? Uh, here you could see a picture of a uh, a harvest machine, we call it the Harvest Buddy. So they, in this picture, they're harvesting sugar kelp. 
But as far as seaweeds go in Alaska, the main species of seaweed that are being uh, grown are sugar kelp, Saccharina latissima, or ribbon kelp, Ilaria marginata. There is some effort to cultivate bull kelp, Baneriocystis leukiana, um, but those haven't grown to scale yet. There is also blue mussels, Pacific oysters, and Pacific gooey duck that are being farmed. And so what does this all look like here in Alaska? Um, here you can see a picture of a uh, bulk kelp uh, hot sauce uh, that's made locally and some locally grown oysters. But in Alaska, when we think about kelp farming, really the idea is to go large scale. On the upper left, you could see a picture of a 100 plus acre farm in Southeast Alaska outside of Craig. Um, and then on the bottom left is a farm that's in Kodiak, Alaska. This is by Alaska Ocean Farm, so a large tension system. And then on the right is just a picture of one of the large spar buoys from a, another kelp farm here in Kodiak. And when it comes to shellfish, really oysters are the, the main drivers of the mariculture industry in Alaska. So we have to talk about oysters just because it is really the bulk of what's going on. Though most oyster farmers are at some point starting to think about kelp. So we have a couple different systems, stackable trays, lantern nets, and flip bags. There is no uh, on ball on bottom cultivation of oysters in Alaska. Uh, there are no native oysters in Alaska, so we're actually importing seed of Pacific oysters to outplant and grow. This is about a one and a half to two million dollar industry. Um, it's a relatively small industry. We don't have final sales numbers for 2022, but in 2021, there's about four and a half million oysters sold, about 530,000 pounds of kelp. Um, most of this was cultivated kelp, so seeded lines that were outplanted. There was a very small amount of kelp that was um, naturally set on oyster gear that was then cut off and, and sold commercially. There's a tiny bit of other shellfish species as well. There are 81 aquatic farm permits. However, as of last year, only 49 of those farms had inventory um, and about 29 of those had sales. And so if we take a step back to understand how the industry got here and the trends that we're seeing. On the left-hand side, you see thousands of pounds of clams and mussels um, starting from the early 1990s, going all the way to 2021. And you can see there's only a very small amount of mussels that are curr currently being cultivated and sold. And we don't see uh, any real clam sales, though some farms do have gooey ducks on their farm sites. On the right hand side, you could see numbers of oysters that were sold. It is a downward trend, but we expect that trend to start moving up and that's in millions of numbers of oysters. But the real growth is seaweed um, and seaweed being the kelp, the sugar kelp and ribbon kelp. We are seeing exponential growth. Um, once the 2022 numbers come out, you will once again see we have another large uptick in the amount of cultivated kelp that's being uh, grown and sold here in Alaska. There is a record number of permit applications that have gone in to start new kelp farm sites. Um, and so we expect this industry to just have some really rapid growth here. And why is kelp being grown in Alaska? Well, at the moment, it's all for, for food grade, grade products. Um, so it's going into salsas and hot, so hot sauces and then other additives like dried kelp to put in as seasonings and beer as well. The Kodiak Brewery actually brewed a, a kelp beer. Uh, you could see on the left, that's our former governor, Governor Bill Walker, trying our kelp beer. Um, and then oysters are being grown as well. Uh, those are going to the uh, primary to the restaurant industry. There's a lot of support in Alaska right now uh, to grow 
been working on provided resources as that demand has grown. And I'm going to step through some of the resources that have been recently developed. Here at Alaska Sea Grant, we developed a seaweed handling and processing guideline for Alaska. Uh, this guidance is really to support commercial processing, so hundreds of pounds to tens of thousands of pounds per day um, to be processed. I'm not for sure about Canada, but in the United States, uh, processing capacity has been recognized as one of the national bottlenecks to growing the industry. Also in Alaska, there are, there are many research projects, but some of them are looking into using kelp as a biofuel and then assessing how can we expand the market, develop the market to support this Alaska industry, and where are good hubs um, for supporting seaweed growth, or the growth of the seaweed industry, which is currently uh, the kelp, the large brown leafy bladed uh, seaweeds. We recently developed some permitting guidance. There's a fairly arduous and lengthy process to get a permit, and it's a joint permit and lease through the state of Alaska. We have an online permitting guidance portal. Um, you don't actually apply for your permit through here, but this web portal steps you through site assessments, planning out the farm, then applying for those permits and leases, and then going through renewals, amendments, and transfers that they may want to do later, and then some additional resources as well. This is also available as a PDF download. Uh, in Alaska, there are uh, many locations that have limited uh, bandwidth, and so having something that's printable is really important. And when we developed this guidance, it was in partnership with the state agencies and the federal agencies as well to make sure we were providing good and accurate guidance. After this website was completed and the guidance um, available for people to download and read, the state gave us feedback that it was a record number of permit applications that came in, and those applications were more complete in general than they had ever seen before. In Alaska, it used to be about a two year turnaround from the time that you submitted a complete application till whether you found out whether you're going to be permitted or not. And now that timeline is down to about a year from submitting a complete application and getting that that permit actually issued to you. And because we know site selection is uh, such a critical part of starting your seaweed farm, we've been putting a lot of work into that as well. One of the first things that we funded and supported was the development of a mariculture map. The idea of this map is to allow you to create the required maps that are in your application. Um, there are three different maps that you have to create that shows where your farm site is uh, that you have to have and there's a lot of details on what exactly has to be on that map so hopefully this will help and some of the things that uh, this map also helps you figure out is where are those anadromous streams so you could see in the purple anadromous streams uh, we certainly can't have a farm site near where we have salmon runs also marine mammal haulouts harbor seals sea lions uh, walrus those are marked in this map as well. Current farming locations are in this map. In addition to that, you can bring in some real-time data that looks at such things as uh, sea surface temperatures and salinities and, and a good deal more as well. And this is really all just to give you a high level idea of what, um, what is in that area when you're thinking about planning where your farm site's going to be. But as uh, we all know and can probably assume, you can't pick a farm site by just looking at a map. So something else that we've developed and we will hopefully have out soon is a site assessment toolkit. So this is a, a relatively inexpensive kit. It comes in a nice plastic case. This kit was in, developed in partnership with Dr. Sherry Umanzer with the University of Alaska Fairbanks College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences. Um, so this is a complete toolkit. You could bring on the skiff with you, bring on your vessel to make sure you have the correct environmental conditions for growing your seaweeds. 
So a couple of things that you need to consider and pay attention to is uh, temperature. So there's a thermometer in there. Uh, salinity, we include a refractometer. You want to know transparency in that you need a site that's going to have a good light penetration. Uh, kelp needs light to grow, so there's a SETI disc included. Nutrient availability is um, a really high consideration. We do have a fair number of nitrogen deprived areas in Alaska, and so there's Niskin bottles in there that help you collect those appropriate water samples to then send in and have tested. Currents, uh, kelp needs good water flow, so having something that's relatively easy and cheap to uh, assess currents in a given location, you can invest and and buy a, a current meter that is really expensive, or you can use something that's like a timer with a bottle and string. Some things that aren't included in the, the kit are some things that you should consider when site when selecting a site are winds and then depths and substrate of that farm site. You need good anchorage for your farm site. You need it to be protected, but still have those other things that these large seaweeds, the kelps like is, and that's good current flow. This kit comes with a user information booklet. It reads you, uh, you could read through exactly how you want to select your site, whether the parameters that you need for good uh, growth of kelp, and how to use all of the tools that are in the kit. And I apologize that this these pictures don't have the verbiage in here, but we are still um, going through some licensing details right now with the kit, so I'm not allowed to share what the, the written instructions are during this presentation, but you can see that we have these quick user guides. Uh, um, they're kind of one pagers that are laminated in that kit that shows you these simple pictures on how to use these different tools. Um, again, like a relatively easy kit to use, inexpensive, but gives you a good idea of what your site is looking like, what the, that water looks like. But we're not only providing kits, but training as well. We started hosting seaweed farm trainings in 2020. Those first trainings were in person uh, and we had 48 attendees and those attendees were selected out of a group of about 300 Alaskans that applied to attend these workshops. So a ton of interest. 2021, as we all know, it was COVID and we couldn't have a uh, face-to-face trainings and so that went online. But now we're moving forward. We are currently hosting some local uh, hands on trainings here in the Kodiak area and we'll have another one in February or it's actually just moved to March of 2023. This will be a four day hands on training in Kodiak and it covers such topics as identifying the different seaweed species, uh, life cycles of seaweeds, the hatchery process, site selection, uh, using these tools that we've developed that are online, farm gear design and deployment, seeding, um, and then uh, business planning and the regulatory process. And those applications for this upcoming training are available through our website, alaskaseagrant.org. We also are hosting some workshops on seaweed handling and processing. We had our first workshop this last year in April. We had 17 participants representing nine different Alaska coastal communities. This was a hands-on workshop at the Kodiak Seafood and Marine Science Center, which is a facility that was designed and developed to support the seafood processing industry. So in the past, it is focused on the wild harvest fisheries. We're now including um, Mariculture as well, so so seaweeds. This workshop is really based upon our handling and processing guidance that is available on our website as well, and that's a free download. Or for a very nominal price, you, you can have it printed and we'll ship it to you. But it covers an overview of the industry, regulations and permitting for Alaska, uh, processing economics and business management, processing equipment. There's a nice uh, table of processing equipment at different scales, stabilization techniques, packaging, food safety, and uh, developing value added products. 
We also teach some other classes such as hazardous controls, critical control points, and better uh, preventative controls as well. staff and facility. Something that's related that we've recently been working on is acidified seaweeds, uh, trying to develop a fermented product that's shelf stable. Um, seaweed itself doesn't have the right sugars in it to ferment, but you can add in other sugars and create a fermented product. And uh, kelp tortilla chips and uh, yeah, kelp tortilla chips. So on the left hand side, you see the inside view of Taco Loco, which is Alaska uh, tortilla and chip company. And in the middle picture, that is a picture of dried and ground sugar cup that we provided for their product development. And to support this industry, we also have an access to capital for Mariculture businesses webinar series that's going on. If you are interested, if anyone on here is interested, these webinars were recorded and are available on our website as well. And I put in that uh, web access link there. And in Alaska, I mentioned before that there is a lot of support here within the state to grow the industry. A couple of very large projects that Alaska Sea Grant is involved with. Uh, the first one being the Mariculture Restoration and Research and Restoration Consortium. This is a $25 million project that was funded through the Exxon Valdez Oil Spill Trustee Council. There's a fairly long list of partners you can see here on the left, uh, but this project is looking at what the impacts of farms are. Uh, what are the impacts to the physiochemical environment and then to the biological communities as well? Everything from the plankton to benthic communities, the pelagic communities, marine birds and marine mammals. And then also working on farm uh, efficiency and, and enhancements for farm productions and product development. So this is a fairly large project that's going to happen over the next 10 years. And another project that was recently funded by the EDA is the Alaska Mariculture Cluster. This is a $49 million project to grow the industry and has a, a lot of different projects that are funded within it. Um, I didn't want to take the time here to talk about those, but you, you're free to ask questions and I can answer them to the best of my ability or go to the website as well. Both of these projects are just starting. Uh, both of them actually just had their kickoff meetings last week. And so there's a lot more to come out of there. But but really the, the point of talking about this is that it, this industry looks like it is going to grow and, and everyone here is trying to, to move that forward. And with that, I'll go ahead and stop and open up for questions. My email address is here as well, and I'm happy to share the slides with Logan and he could pass them along. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. That's that was fantastic. And I, I, I kind of I do agree with a couple of the things you've said, especially with uh, the processing being a bit of a bottleneck. Um, it's a bit of the same down here, but there are some cool things popping up here and there with uh, a few different places that are processing count now. And it's um, with, I've done a little bit of it. And for me, it was quite a different product to work with, but the professionals make it look very easy. So mm -hmm. there's a bit of a learning curve there. So it's cool to see that you have all the processing training going on um, for that. And um, those maps and the portals that you guys have available uh, like super helpful as well. Those are uh, those are really cool. Um, so yeah, I'll open the floor for questions for Tom and Melissa. So uh, if you just use the reaction thing, which looks like a smiley face with a hand up, um, if I if I see you pop up with a smiley face or a hand or whatever you decide to use, um, I'll just call your name and ask away. All right, Nicole, looks like you got a question there. Yeah, thanks, Logan. Um, and thanks, Melissa, for your presentation. Um, I guess I just wanted to kind of commend uh, C. Grant and the folks up in Alaska on the work that you've done. It seems like you're, you're definitely um, ahead of the game compared to us down here. Um, 
you know, particularly some of the stuff that's been developed around assisting with permitting. Um, I've been working um, for Atlegay Fisheries Society and we've been trying to develop um, a kelp restoration uh, and aquaculture project down uh, around Quadra Island. We're actually working with North Island College on that as well. And one of the, the barriers to our project has really been the permitting process down mm -hmm. here. Uh, it's definitely, definitely been a challenge. So seeing some of the products that you guys have developed up there um, is, is really great to see. Um, and even, you know, some of the the monitoring tools and things like that, that, that have been developed is, is awesome. Um, I just wanted to ask, I guess with that, um, is some of the training that you talked about, are those only open to uh, Alaska residents or, or are there opportunities to kind of open that more broadly, maybe for some of like the virtual workshops and things like that? Yeah. So, Pretty much all of the initial trainings were closed door to Alaska residents only, but we we're opening them up now. And so we would welcome anyone to submit applications. Right now we're really focusing on the hands on face to face workshops, um, but but we would still welcome applications from anywhere. And just to go back to that that regulatory process, you know, there's been a lot of demand to help provide guidance so people are are putting in good applications to get a farm site and they're really thinking through where they should establish a farm but there's many more conversations that we still need to have and we, we still have some issues with our permitting um for example it's it's difficult to get a very small farm like a small experimental farm um so we're just figuring that out like can someone go set out one line of seeded seeded line to see if it is a good spot to actually grow kelp. And so that's something they're working on. Um, but then restoration. Restoration is a whole nother topic as well. And and we still need to figure out how do we permit to restore areas that um, that are not doing well. We have quite a few urchin barrens in Alaska, which is I don't think is on the forefront of people's minds as you think about with like California, other places like that. Okay, thank you. Uh, Tom, looks like you have a, a question there as well. Yeah, Melissa, thank you so much. That was a, a great presentation and really in insightful and just want to echo Nicole's sentiments, uh, how great it is to see what's going on up there. Um, you mentioned permitting and permitting with respect to restoration. I just wanted to get your insight and if you had any thoughts on um, frameworks for uh, regulating restoration versus mariculture and how um, they might not be the exact same thing. They don't have the same intention. The end result is very different. And do you think that they should be put through uh, similar or the same regulatory frameworks? Um, would love to get your thoughts on that. You know, I think for Alaska, it, it would kind of have to be different. So right now, aquaculture is regulated through the Department of Commercial Fisheries. And so one of the requirements of your aquatic farm is you have to make a profit. Uh, and clearly in restoration efforts, you, you're not there to make a profit, of course. And so I do think it would have to go through different avenues. You know, if you want to do a regulatory change for aquatic farming, you, you need to go through the Board of Fisheries and their, their mindset is really on, on commercial and supporting industries. So yeah. And uh, just to follow up, you mentioned in your presentation that the turnaround time was decreased from two years to one year. That's super exciting. Do you mm -hmm. uh, have any insight as to how that was accomplished? I, yeah, more people. There was more people to process the applications. And so that was actually an initiative that the governor took on, and that was to pr uh, create more efficient, more positions within Department of Natural Resources who's providing your ocean space lease. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. Such a simple solution. Um, I got, <laughs> looks like I have another question here from William. So go ahead, William. Doesn't, I can't quite hear you there. Oh, there, yep, there you go. Okay. 
Okay, yeah, I was just having a mic issue. Um, I'm William Nelson with the Metlakatla First Nation. We're just south of the Alaska border there, south of Metlakatla, Alaska. Anyhow, um, yeah, Metlakatla has been involved in a number of things with, with kelp for a number of years. And one thing, we're part of an aggregate coastal First Nations, which are 14 nations along the BC coast. And one thing, part of our monitoring programs are we're noticing the emergence of invasive species, especially bryozoans that are starting to impact kelp. And I'm wondering for Alaska, if you're noticing that, and as well as for, I think, Tom, if down in, you know, as, as looking to produce, you know, seed stock for kelp, if that's something that is a concern in when you're developing seed stock for, for kelp to distribute it elsewhere. <clears throat> um, yeah, so, so yes, invasives are becoming a, a big concern, especially with green crab showing up in Metlakatla, we know about. So having green crab coming in to Alaska is something that was kind of expected, but scary when you found it. And there have been quite a bit of issues with invasive tunicates. Um, the tunicates will come in and just absolutely cover oyster gear. We know if we monitor for them and if we can catch them right, right away, you have the ability to potentially eradicate those invasives from your farm site. But if you're not waiting for it, they get established, and then you have major problems for, for many industries. And, and so, yes, and the Alaska Department of Fish and Game is really trying to take the lead in monitoring for those. And so they have some more information. I can connect you with Tammy Davis there. As far as kelps go and um, potential invasives for seeds in Alaska, we have a 50-50 rule. This is outside the Metlakatla Reserve, which they own the rights to their waters. But outside of that, there's a 50-50 rule where every farmer at the beginning of the season needs to go out and collect sori, the reproductive structures, from 50 individuals, and they have to be within 50 kilometers of your farm site. Uh, and so that's every year. So your parental stock is always coming from within that area. So you're hopefully not spreading things around. Yeah, um, as far as uh, your question with regards to invasive species and kelp and Barkley Sound, um, we don't see the same kinds of problems with the bryozoans in Barkley Sound that have been observed on sort of the central and north coasts of BC. Um, Membranipera, is a species of bryozoan, is the most common one that we have here, uh, but it isn't quite as much um, of, of a concern as it is up, up in the central coast where kelps are sinking and it's really affecting uh, kelp forests up there. Um, we do see it here, but it, it comes and goes seasonally. Um, another invasive species that we're seeing kind of coming in and replacing uh, some potential kelp forests is sargassum, which is an invasive species or a genus. Uh, and Sargassum muticum is an invasive species of that genus from Japan, which is coming in and we're seeing uh, what used to be Macrocystis giant kelp beds, um, you know, in previous years has now been replaced by Sargassum. Um, hope that answers your question. But yeah, as far as transporting, um, transporting uh, invasive species around, uh, our hatchery at West Coast Kelp is, is extremely diligent and being really sterile and using sterile seawater and sterilizing and cleaning cleaning our sori. So the only thing we're culturing is the intended kelp. Um, and uh, BC has adopted that 50 kilometer radius rule that came from Alaska. So now any kelp seed that is produced for a kelp farm in BC has to come from within 50 kilometers of that farm site. Yeah, and I will say we haven't seen any of those invasive bryozoans in Alaska that, that anyone has documented anyways. Okay, thanks. And if I can, just a follow up, I guess, just about, you know, they have that 50 50 rule, but has there been any, I guess, studies on genetics for diversity in the kelp within Alaska? Or I know BC is looking into that for the BC coast. That's something that we've heard through our partnerships with the province of BC. There has been some, some small kind of pilot scale studies, but Part of one of these big uh, projects that was just funded is to kind of dive into that question is because people really want to know what the genetic diversity is of the kelps here. And if that 50-50 rule is, even makes sense, um, not every, we don't know. It was kind of an arbitrary rule with the state just really wanting to be conservative. They, they just pick some numbers.
Awesome. Uh, Tom, you have one more question in the chat here. Um, looking at the green gravel trays, there was some curiosity about the holes in the bottoms of the trays. Uh, what purpose do those holes serve? That's a good question. So um, I'm the the holes that you're seeing are because those that green gravel are in baskets, and the baskets are then in the growth chambers or in the tanks. So that way I can move, um, you know, a larger volume of of gravel at a time rather than moving one rock at a time. Um, when I need to do a water change, move the gravel. I can move the gravel in the tray without having to move the seawater as well, which is really heavy. Thank you for the question. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, with their hands up for questions. So we'll call it a day there, I guess. Uh, Tom and Melissa, thank you again for coming and presenting. Really appreciate it. And I'm sure that uh, the guests on here appreciate the information you have as well. Um, everyone, please, thank you. Oh, I got it. Yeah, thanks to NSERC as well for uh, the funding to host. But please tune in next time as well. Um, we're going to be having it kind of once a month through to June, like I mentioned. So the next one might be a little bit earlier in the morning, but Tom and Melissa, please join us again to listen in on that. It'd be fantastic to have you guys again. And thank you again to presenting. But otherwise, everyone, please enjoy the rest of your day. And yeah, we'll see you again next time. Thank you. Cool. Thanks. Bye bye. Thank you.